Welcome to the Wounds of the Faithful podcast, brought to you by DSW Ministries. Your host is singer, songwriter, speaker, and domestic violence advocate, Diana Winkler. She is passionate about helping survivors in the church heal from domestic violence and abuse and trauma. This podcast is not a substitute for professional counseling or qualified medical help. Now, here is Diana. Good morning, everybody. Well, it's morning here where I'm at. A beautiful Saturday morning. I don't usually record on a Saturday morning, but it fit the schedule of my guest today. Today we're talking about skepticism of Christianity, doubts about your faith, abandoning your faith, never having your own relationship with Jesus at all. My guest today is Janelle Wood, and she's host of the podcast, Finding Something Real, which she describes, it's for seekers and believers needing encouragement. For the believer struggling with faith and the skeptic struggling with doubt. Now, neither of us are apologetic experts. <laughs> we'll be sitting here chatting about this topic today as sisters in Christ over our favorite beverage. We don't have all the answers, but we're having an honest, real conversation about why we believe in Jesus. And it's okay to have questions or doubts about what we believe. The point is to talk about these things and don't ignore them. Our listeners include those that have doubted their faith, abandoned their faith altogether, those that never had a faith of their own, yet religion was shoved down their throats, and those that went through horrible abuse and trauma that don't know if they trust God anymore. And we have victims from the troubled teen industry. Now, I know you're out there because I've talked with you on social media. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, by the way. So please welcome Janelle Wood to the show. Janelle, great to see you again, and thanks for coming on the show. Can you tell the folks about your, your background and expertise? Sure. Well, Diana, thanks. First of all, thanks for inviting me on your podcast. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. And thank you. Um, it was fun getting to know you the other day. So, um, yeah, I, I host a podcast called the Finding Something Real podcast. Um, it's about finding restoration, eternity, authenticity, and love and relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, really, it's for women, especially young women who aren't sure about relationship with Jesus. Um, but um, before that, way before that, before four kids and all that, um, <laughs> I was a student of psychology. I went to Seattle Pacific and got my bachelor's in psychology, minor in communications, and really just wanted to help people. I always felt like I had these two dual things about me, very creative also very like wanting to work with people in the social services industry. And when I was in undergrad, I worked with young women um, who were coming from uh, pretty uh, hard backgrounds. Um, I worked at an in-home um, place for teen girls. Some of them were pregnant or parenting. Some of them were just homeless and had nowhere else to go. And that was really eye-opening for me. Um, I'd grown up in a fairly sheltered, uh, you know, Christian home. Mm -hmm. And I remember just thinking, uh, wow, this is um, such an amazing opportunity to work with young women in crisis. And so that led me to pursuing um, a master's degree in counseling psychology um, because I tried to admin work and I was like, <laughs> I wasn't made for this. I was made uh, to work yeah. with women. And um and so then uh, I tried counseling, but what I really loved doing and I found that I um, was good at was I loved working with 
women in crisis as an advocate. And so I started volunteering with um, a protection order program that was uh, put on by uh, King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Um, I started interning with the Bellevue Police Department as an advocate there, just helping out, uh, reading police reports, calling alleged victims, talking with them through the process. And I realized, wow, I really enjoy this work. Um, I really mm -hmm. enjoy um, both the investigative side of getting to know, um, you know, things that are happening um, and then getting to know women on um, a real personal level and then helping them through a really um, trying time. And so I did that as a volunteer, as, as an intern for um, a number of years before I got hired on with the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. And I worked in the misdemeanor unit as an advocate um, in the domestic violence unit for several years before I had a family. So that's my background in um, social services and, and things obviously have changed in the last 11 years since being a stay-at-home mom and doing more of the creative things. But my heart has always been to work with women in crisis and women who are hurting. So, Wow, that's, that's amazing. I had, I had thought of going back to school to, to be a counseling major, but uh, I've been to school a lot over the years. I just, at this stage in life, I, I can't <laughs> imagine going back to school and having to deal with paying for it in the time required, which it's a lot of time to get a um, bachelor's degree. Um, I do my groups, of course, my mending the soul groups. And, you know, I do what I can with what I have in helping mm -hmm. others but you must have had some really, really painful stories in your work that you did. Yeah. Was that really hard emotionally and stressful, I bet? Yeah, you know, at the time, um, so going back a little bit, when I was 12 years old, my oldest sister, who was 11 years older than me, um, she was in an abusive relationship. And so I had that, um, that memory of even at 12 years old, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, like grabbing <laughs> my nieces and like trying to help her, uh, you know, with my family out of that situation, um, it was oh. her husband. And um, anyway, so as a young married who was now working, um, doing her dream job, which was to be an advocate in uh, the prosecutor's office, um, it was a hard, it was a hard thing, but I, I would often go back to, you know, like my sister and people that I cared about. I think if it's rooted in love, you're willing to make the sacrifice mm -hmm. and um, something, I was just listening to something that reminded me of this this morning, but, you know, our passions are usually rooted in suffering. Uh, the word for passion is rooted in that, that word for suffering. And so mm -hmm. what are you willing to suffer for? I was willing to suffer through some crazy stories and experiences and walking alongside people who are hurting. And, you know, a lot of times there is a, a heaviness that comes with that kind of work, but it was something I was willing to do because um, I believed in, in helping women find freedom. And also uh, just, I think there's such a, a gift in hearing people and hearing their stories and, um, one of my favorite quotes is by a guy named David Augsburger, and I think it says, um, I'm going to misquote it now, but it says something along the lines of being heard is so close to being loved that to the average person, they're basically indistinguishable. Mm. And I think when we hear people and we're willing to carry that hurt a little bit, not that we can fix it, uh, but that we're willing to walk through with them in that process, um, a lot of times that is, it looks like love. Um, yeah. So I, I really loved that work. Um, it was very difficult because as I'm sure some of your listeners or, or maybe you know too, Diana, um, the justice system is very flawed. And mm -hmm. um, in misdemeanors, a lot of times I was working with women who maybe initially wanted their spouse or their boyfriend to get help. And then as the process wore on, we're like, you know what, we're fine. I don't want anything to do with this. And so in a way, um, it was very, uh, there was never a happy ending, you know, a happy ending was, <laughs> you know, maybe he got treatment. Um, but it, it was very, it, it could become very tiresome. But for me, as a Christian, 
um, my energy didn't come from, you know, my work necessarily. It was <laughs> coming from the Lord and then to be able to pour that out um, and go home at the end of the day and, and just be really grateful um, for the opportunity to do what I got to do. So, uh, yeah, I really loved that job. I just had an interview last week with um, a judge from Northern California um, named Tim Fall. I don't know if you know him, but mm -mm. he said a lot of the same things that you did about the justice system and how he has to be he has to be non-biased and neutral. And he usually knew who was the guilty and who was the innocent, but he had to go through the process mm -hmm. that was given to him by the by the court system that we have. And yeah, sometimes it's it is really hard, but I was glad to talk to him and know that there were Christians in the justice system you know, that are passionate about helping people, helping, you know, victims of abuse and other crimes, that he's going to give everybody a fair trial and a voice to have their cases heard. So that was a really interesting interview. Um, so tell us about your your wonderful kids and your husband, you, <laughs> you mentioned yeah. there. Yeah, well, I have four biological children. Um, my oldest is 11 and my youngest is five. And um, my husband is a school administrator. Um, we've been married for 16 years. Um, I always was a very romantic person. I always thought, oh, you know, someday I'm going to meet Prince Charming. It's going to be wonderful um, that, uh, you know, we have a great marriage, but that's not the case, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. and um, it's not, it, it's not that um, it's not a great marriage. It's that um, I quickly discovered uh, being a newlywed, you know, 15, 14 years ago that my husband was not going to solve all my uh, insecurities and my, my <laughs> issues with rejection and all the other things that you, you know, individually we bring into a marriage. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and when we were, you know, struggling uh, in, you know, communication and figuring out new marriage stuff, um, I was like, you know what, let's have a baby. Let's, <laughs> like, that will make it all great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, people say that, you know, but I, you never like actually say, well, that's going to fix it. But in my mind, looking back, that's exactly what was going on. And um, it's interesting because uh, we couldn't have a baby right away. We, um, we ended up having a miscarriage uh, at 10 weeks and it was a missed miscarriage, which means um, I went in for an ultrasound thinking, you know, I had all the symptoms, everything seemed normal. Uh, I had gotten a new camera for my birthday that year. And we had told all my family, we were going to have a baby. We had started buying everything and we go in and, uh, you know, there's no heartbeat. And, um, the next day I had mm. to have surgery and it was heartbreaking. And I remember being so angry with God, mm. um, and feeling rejected by him and, um, anyway, and so that, that was interesting. And I remember just being like, okay. And, and meanwhile, I was working at the prosecutor's office and working with a lot of women who, um, were having babies or, uh, were having babies that they didn't want. And so that was very difficult. Mm -hmm. And so I just started praying God, you know, um, I just don't let it happen like it happened before. You know, I just want a family. I promise that I was making deals with God, you know, oh, yeah. uh, like, Lord, if only you'll give me a baby, I'll raise them to know you and all this stuff. And um, a few months later, we had another uh, miscarriage that happened very similarly. Um, and I, uh, I just was devastated, you know, um, here I was, you know, doing the good work mm. and uh, feeling like, oh, you know, I've got the career that I wanted. I've got, you know, a nice husband. Yes, he's not Prince Charming, but, you know, we're, we're good Christian people, you know, in my mind. And why, God, would you allow that kind of suffering? Mm. Um, and so that was, um, that was very difficult, um, especially as more and more people came into my life who um, were having unplanned pregnancies. 
And um, we went through a year of infertility, which in retrospect, and even at the time I was so thankful for, because I just remember begging God, please don't let us get pregnant again right now, please. Mm. uh, If we're just going to lose another one. But I remember just looking at my husband. um, I'm sorry, Diana, I'm going on a tangent here, but no, keep going. (laughs) I remember looking at him, you know, one night and just being like, how do you know God is real? Because at the time I was just so angry and frustrated. And um, I always tell people that my marriage, uh, you know, it's kind of like a heartbeat, like my husband's like this flat line, and I'm the up and down one, you know, (laughs) and um, together, we're great. And we're alive, but he'd be dead without me. (laughs) Like He's just like, "Uh." and sometimes him being so solid has been such a gift for me. And he looked at me and, and we were grieving totally differently. You know, I was so hurt and angry. And he was acting like, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, I think he felt helpless. Um, But he just looked at me and I remember him saying, you know, I'm a science guy because he was a science teacher for many years before he became an administrator. And he said, "Um, I know for every action, there's an equal reaction. And he goes, that doesn't, it's not very hard to see all the evil in the world and see how much, uh, you know, sin can do to create uh, division and hardship and all these horrible things. And he goes, so for as much evil as I see in the world, I know that there's an equal good. And um, for me in that moment of just being so hurt and angry with the Lord, that helped me so much. And then I um, started doing a Bible study that really, really helped me because ultimately so much of my issue was I didn't believe God was who he said he was. Um, and so I started doing a Bible study by Beth Moore called Believing God. And uh, that I've done that Bible study now multiple times. And each time I go back to it, I'm like, man, that helped me so much to realize my whole vision of God at that time in my life was um, really skewed because I thought if I'm only good enough, then God will reward that. And, you know, it'll be okay. And if I just do my part, he'll do his part, kind of like a genie in the bottle or right. really my grandfather. And that's not, um, that's not who God is at all. No. He's holy apart from, from anything I can do, right? It doesn't have a lot to do with uh, me in that, in that sense. So anyway, um, a long answer to the story. Yet we have four beautiful biological children. I say we have four, um, four international daughters. Um, and I can share about that too, if you'd like, but yes, I'd like to Sorry. hear about your exchange students. What was that like? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, after a, a total journey of surrender and, you know, saying, okay, God, whatever, whatever your plans are for my life, I want, I want you basically, I just want you. Um, I went through a a series of, or a a period of time where I was just like, okay, if God is who he says he is, uh, which I believe he is, then, um, I, I want, I want to be all in. I want to be surrendered to him. And I started reading this book called Crazy Love by Francis Chan, which was a, a big turning point for me. And my husband and I, um, were reading the Bible regularly at that point for a long time, you know, we had gone to church here and there and we called ourselves Christians, which we were, but, um, it had never been like a super serious thing for us. And, um, so we were reading scripture and then I started reading this Bible and I was like, man, God, I want to be or reading this book and, um, I want to be all in. And, uh, the whole premise of the book is if God is who he says he is, like our response is crazy love in exchange, you know, like it's just a natural thing. It's a natural thing to be overflowing with love for him and want to surrender to him. And um, it was almost as if uh, someone had been like looking inside my heart and like put the words on page. You know, I felt like (laughs) exactly how I've been feeling for a long time. This is amazing. And so that led us to um, opening up our home to exchange students. We prayed about opening up our home in some way or capacity. Um, And uh, at the time, um, exchange just kind of fell in our lap. And so we started opening up our home to young women from across the world who didn't know the Lord. And, um, and so now I say we have a Dutch daughter from, uh, you know, the Netherlands. She lives over there now. She's 21. Uh, We have a Taiwanese daughter. Um, We have an Italian daughter. 
And uh, this year we have a, a Swedish daughter who um, unfortunately couldn't come to live with us because of COVID, but mm. whom uh, we love and, and talk to on a regular basis. So, and she actually is a Christian. So it's been quite a journey and it's opened up our hearts um, to a world we didn't even know existed. Um, and it's been really special. So yeah, that's our, that's our life. <laughs> I was listening to your podcast, and I believe is it your Dutch daughter that never, never, I guess what you would call converted or believe well, you know, in God anymore. <laughs> um, it's interesting because um, only one, only one has. Um, well, she's my Swedish daughter is a believer. Um, our Taiwanese daughter, she did come to the Lord when she was with us, but. Um, has since, uh, she's not sure about faith. Mm. Um, Our Italian daughter, she's um, unsure as well. And then our Dutch daughter, who is kind of like my baby. um, (laughs) I just love her. (laughs) She's the thing that started everything. Um, She is more close to faith. She's agnostic. Um, But I remember when I, when I said yes to this, you know, I was like, okay, Lord, I think you're leading us this way. We're going to do this. Um, these girls are going to get saved. They're going to, they're going to meet you because we're Mm. going to take them to church. We're going to live it out loud. We love you. We're going to share the gospel with them. And I quickly learned that um, salvation is up to God and God alone. And uh, not that he, he desires everyone to to be saved. You know, God desires everybody to be saved, but um, you know, there's a human element in all of this and and free will is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, our job uh, as I see it was just to be obedient to that, that calling that God put on our hearts to open up our home. And, um, and yeah, I love those girls and they're a big part of why I do what I do with the podcast. So, so, I mean, how do you start a conversation with somebody who has no concept of a relationship with an almighty God? Mm. You know, it's interesting because all of us were made to worship. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's not, it's not a question of, uh, you know, desiring something to adore. We all, we all have that in our hearts. God planted that in each and every one of us. And even when I talk to my exchange daughters about that, uh, who don't believe in a Christian God, you know, it's, there's no debating that because they know, you know, it's Netflix or it's a boyfriend or it's, you know, all these different things that, they're desiring or it's, you know, the job or the money, this kind of thing. Um, but I find that, you know, in scripture, it talks about the, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so when you invite people into your life and you are naturally um, falling in love with Jesus, when you are already, um, you know, spending time in his word, when you're already talking to him, when you're already, uh, you know, filling your heart with the truth that comes from scripture, there's, there's no hiding it. You Mm -hmm. know, I did an episode with my exchange daughters, all four of them together for the first time over Christmas. And, um, I asked them, you know, is my podcast all about finding Jesus? You know, they're like, yes, (laughs) Janelle. And I said, does that bother you? You know, only one of them is currently uh, pursuing a relationship with Christ. And uh, none, it, does, it didn't bother any one of them. And I said, well, why do you think I do it? And they said, it's because you're passionate. You found something and you want other people to find it too. And I think that when we find something real in Christ, that's why I love using the acronym real, restoration, eternity, authenticity, and love, all things that can only be found in relationship in their truest form with Jesus. Um, When I found something real for myself, um, it's so easy to share it. I mean, it it doesn't lessen the awkwardness sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're driving along and you're going to the store, when you're talking to somebody about their insecurities or their hurt, or maybe their daddy issues, or all these different things that come up naturally in relationship with somebody that you care about, of course, you're going to be talking about the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that, and naturally, you know, I, there's a great book actually for anyone listening, who's interested in talking more about uh, faith. And you're just wondering where to get started. First of all, I'd recommend that Believing God study by Beth Moore. Excellent, excellent. 
Um, but then if you already feel like, man, I'm, I'm there with God already. I love, I love spending time with him. You know, this is like my bread and butter. I have to be with him and I want to share him more. And where do I go from here? Um, there's a book by a guy named William Fay, I believe. It's called Share Jesus Without Fear, and it's very practical. Mm -hmm. And it talks about like starting those conversations with people and saying, you know, um, what do you believe? Uh, like existential questions, you know, because right. all of us wonder what happens uh, when we die or what this world is about mm -hmm. or why we're here. Those are natural questions for almost anybody. So it's pretty, I, I, I don't mean to say that it's super easy, but I, I feel like it becomes no. very natural as you talk about the Lord more. Oh, let me tell you, I, I I have a bachelor's degree in theology. I went to a Baptist missionary college. I was trained to knock on doors and talk <laughs> about Jesus and lead them to Christ, you know, a church planner for 13 years. But I will be honest and say, even with that background, that sharing my faith was never easy. Mm -hmm. It scared me to death, actually. Yeah. Um, but I did it anyway, even though I was afraid because... You know, we're afraid of what people will think of us. We're afraid of not having the right answers. You know, I had all the right answers. I, at least I thought I did. Um, but yeah, it was our college that would teach us that, well, you might be the only Christian that somebody will ever meet. And it's all up to you. If you, <laughs> if you blow it, then this person's going to hell. And, you know, that really instilled a lot of fear into me. Because you're knocking on somebody's door or you're you're going through the plan of salvation with somebody. And, you know, I'm finding out that it's not always that formal. A lot of times it's just sharing what God's done for you rather than, okay, here's the Romans road. Da, 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 mm -hmm. da, 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 and by that time, the guy's already checked out and like okay, what's for lunch? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I think we do a disservice to people when we put shame and guilt on uh, evangelism. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, um, I think for a long time, I mean, I grew up, you know, going to church and stuff and you think, oh, I've got to do it like this, or I got to do it like so-and-so, or, you know, Billy Graham is amazing. Right. I want to be like that. Right. And um, it's not, you know, I mean, some of us maybe are, you know, called to that, you know, sharing in the stadium or knocking on doors. And I think, I think we need to trust that the Holy Spirit will lead us. You know, in scripture, it talks about when we're standing before people that God, the Holy Spirit will give us the words to speak. And um, there's been times when you have those, un like, you know, for me, where I've had those uncomfortable, you know, I hardly know you, but I feel like God wants me to share with you kind of thing. And that can be really awkward. But most of the time it's operating in the elements that God gave me. It's operating in the strengths that he already gave me. And so for somebody listening right now, you know, God has created you uniquely and wonderfully. And so you may may very well feel comfortable talking to people, you know, door to door, sharing something on social media and that kind of thing. Um, but also, you know, it may be in that one-on-one -on -one because like I said earlier, you know, when we listen to people and we hear their stories and we invest in them and we share with them, you know, how much uh, we care about them and love them, regardless of <laughs> what choices they make, um, that, that does something. And I, you know, yes, um, my girls that I love very much, they all know that I love the Lord and mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, sometimes awkward, but they, they don't question that I love them. And the reason is because I've invested in them. I've invested in that relationship, regardless of whether they come to Christ or not. Would I love for them to? Yes, absolutely. That's my heart's cry, you know, for them to know the Lord and uh, for them to spend eternity with, with God. Mm -hmm. But um, it's really going, okay, Lord, like waking up in the morning and going, I want you, I want to be filled up with you. So that way it comes pouring out. And then whatever the outcome is, um, you know, let me be, let that be you, let that be your glory and not mine. Cause I think sometimes we're like, Ooh, if I only do it this way, or if I only, you know, knock on the door, then God's going to bring the harvest. Um, I think a lot of times we don't get to see the harvest this side of eternity, yeah. you know? And I would guess that if any of my girls do come to the Lord, which I'm praying they do, um, they probably won't be me who gets to lead them through the sinner's prayer, gets to, um, have the privilege of that. Now God could just totally you know, uh, say you hey, know. what is going to happen. But, um, it's, 
it's kind of cool to see how God brings people into other people's lives strategically at just the right moment. And it, we don't have to work for it. We don't have to try so hard. All we have to do is say, God, I surrender. I want more of you. Use these hands and feet for your glory. And he's faithful to do that. Right. We just have to have the courage to, to share in that salvation is a, a supernatural thing that happens. Um, I, I had an experience the first time that I had to share, well, that I wanted to share Jesus. <laughs> I had gotten saved when I was 13 and I, you know, went into high school and I started dating this atheist Mm -hmm. And he was fascinating because I'd never met an atheist before. And we had, we had a real whirlwind of a romance. Um, we were, we were in love. It was probably our, our first love, you know. And I thought that everybody wanted to hear about my Jesus. <laughs> I was so excited, you know, being a new Christian and I was on fire for the Lord. And I thought, well, if I share, share my love of Jesus, then he's going to want Jesus too. Mm. And we had so many fights about that very thing about Jesus. He had, he had been raised by atheist. His mom was British and his, um, his father was Filipino, I believe. And, um, they came from a godless society and that's how they raised their son and and he looked at all the bad things that you know that went on in the world and he said well all these terrible things all these evil things happen why does god let these things happen there is no god and he was to call me names you know you're a fool for believing such fairy tales and and uh, if there is a good God up there, then I will be in heaven when I die. And I kept telling him, no, um, unfortunately, if you reject God in this life, you reject Jesus in this life, you will not, you will not be with him in, the, in eternity. And it was really, really painful to, to have those conversations because, you know, as a young believer and and I didn't have all the answers. I had not been to Bible college yet. And so I didn't have all those great answers that we all want to have about theology and the Bible. And um, when one of my Christian friends said, you know, you can't marry him, right? Yeah. And I said, um, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. You're right. If, I, if he doesn't get saved, I, I can't marry him. And so, of course, then I'm like trying really hard to convert him, to get him to be a believer. And he said something to me. He said, if I, if, how did he phrase it? I really want to believe in God, but I can't. Mm -hmm. I can't. Even, even if it means losing you, I cannot believe in this God of yours. And that was the end of it. And it was, and it was extremely painful because we, we cared about each other, Yeah, but we could not, um, we could not exist. Um, we could not go forward in the path together. Um, so I don't know, as far as I know from word of mouth, he's still an atheist and I still pray that he would find the Lord. But um, I don't know, maybe you've had some really difficult conversations like that one. But um, I like what I heard on your podcast about, what was the British fellow's name? It was from Unbelievable? Justin that Brierly. Oh, that was probably one of my favorite episodes. The yeah. Blind Man and the Flashlight. Mm. Yeah. You can shine that flashlight in his eyes and if he's blind he's not going to see it i think that um i don't know did justin barley say that or was it josh white did you listen to josh white's episode i did uh, josh white talked about that too okay. yeah josh white's a pastor out of portland um who has a real heart for evangelism and uh he said 
he said a very similar thing. So it might've been both of them, but, um, they were both good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are two of my favorite episodes actually. Um, but yeah, no, you do have hard conversations and I think too, it's not, there's some questions and answers that we'll never know all the answers to set of eternity. Right. And I think right. one of the things that um, we have to accept is that it, it comes down to faith for sure. You know, there's always going to be that element of faith. Even if you're an agnostic or an atheist, you have to have faith, right? That you, <laughs> you're, you're sure that this all happened by accident. And for me, something that I share with uh, my girls, and it, it came up in the conversation with Justin Brierly, I think, but, um, you know, when I look around, even on my worst day, you know, and I look around this world and I see the intricacies of creation. I see how, you know, we're all uniquely created. I see the tiny little ant, you know, crawling across <laughs> the ground. And I look up and I see the mountains and I see the blue sky and I, I can feel the breeze on my face and the oxygen mm -hmm. and the flowers and the colors and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I can't look at that and not see um, that something created that, yes. right? Even on my worst day. And scripture talks about that, that um, you know, all creation points to a creator, but that to me, the idea that it all just happened by accident um, and all of this order, all of the things that are, I mean, the more you get into science, the more intricacies you discover. I mean, it's crazy mm. how much design has gone into this world. And if I were in the middle of the desert and, I, or, you know, <laughs> some planet somewhere, and I found a book that had, you know, something intelligible written in it, there's no way I would think that happened by accident. So for me, uh, the case for a creator is settled in my mind, absolutely. And then it comes down to a question of, well, if I believe there's a God, who is he? And when I look at different religions and I look at it uh, and I compare that to Jesus Christ, uh, for me, um, there is nobody like Jesus. You know, we don't have a God who just sits up on the throne like a, a grandfatherly, you know, a guy with a wand who says, here, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And wham, bam, you know, and do all this. It, we have a God who sympathizes and knows what it's like to suffer. He knows how broken this world is. And I think um, for me that the, the idea that there is a God who loves me, who created me and mm -hmm. sees the brokenness that sin has brought into this world um, and came down to suffer with me, um, to offer me those real things, to offer restoration, because the whole message of the Bible is a message of restoration and hope. Um, you know, eternity with him, authenticity to see me who I really am on my darkest day and on my best day and love that is grace, you know, that our world doesn't understand. Um, that is a God that I want to worship. That is a God that Amen. I am all for. And, um, and it, it makes sense to me logically. And I'm definitely more of a feeler than a, a logic person. But logically, I go, man, um, you know, that God cares about me and sees. The other thing about Christianity that I share with my girls who aren't Christians is, you know, it's, and I think C.S. Lewis talks about this, but the way that Jesus saw humanity is so on point, you know, it, he saw us in our brokenness. The Christian message is, Hey, you're worse than you think you are, but God is better than you think he is. And he loves you anyway. Right. Yeah. I saw that from Josh White, but uh, he, he shares that, but like, God is crazy about you, even in your brokenness. Yes. And that to me is, um, that is who I want to breathe in and breathe out every day, you know? And I think, for me, I love working with women, but um, social services for me just wasn't enough uh, in a lot of ways because I wanted to share Jesus because this world doesn't offer what he does. And um, so when I talk to my girls and we have conversations about, you know, sexual identity and we talk about, you know, if all this happened by chance and all these different things. I get to share some things with them and I am not perfect. And I definitely am not offering perfect answers, but what I am sharing with them is something authentic and real and um, opening up where I'm at in my relationship with Jesus for them to see. And, um, and that's been a really beautiful thing, even if 
um, as of now, as of today, this recording, uh, they haven't given their lives to the Lord. So, yeah, we um, we went to France twice. I think I saw a picture on your website. You were at Shakespeare and Company. Oh, I love you that guys, place. Yeah. I never got to go in. It was always mobbed. Was both times we were in Paris. But, um, you know, Paris has all these beautiful churches. All over France actually has beautiful, beautiful churches and cathedrals. But it's a secular country. Mm -hmm. And we had stayed with a family in Avignon who uh, who was a Buddhist. Now, he's the real deal Buddhist. He's not, you know, the kind of Buddhist you find at the yoga studio around here that thinks they're Buddhist. But um, he's, he was, he's a kung fu master and he's, he's the real deal. He's friends with the Dalai Lama. Anyway, we had a conversation at breakfast about Christianity. Mm. And his opinion was that, okay, this is what I have a problem with Christianity. Christians have the, the Bible, free salvation, and Jesus, mm -hmm. but they're too busy fighting amongst themselves to make a real impact in the world. Wow. Their lives don't reflect the Jesus they claim to serve. And that was a convicting thought from a non-believer to, to me who has a real faith in Jesus. He has a valid point. Mm -hmm. The Christian churches have dropped the ball in living their, their message that is in the Bible, have dropped the ball in living uh, a Christian life or representing Jesus. You know, uh, the real Jesus isn't offensive, right? It's the Christians that are offensive. Well, what do you think of that? <laughs> <clears throat> yes and no. Um, it's interesting. We were just talking about Josh White because one of the things that he says, in fact, I have one of his quotes um, here because I thought it was so good. Um, he, he said to me, um, or I listened to him say this at Cannon Beach, um, when he was speaking there, he said, I find any church that works at keeping the gospel not offensive is suspect because the pure gospel when it's preached will always offend the flesh because it stands in direct opposition. I think there is an offensiveness to scripture and the idea that we're all sinners in need of a savior. Yeah. Um, I think especially in the world today, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there's this humanistic, like, we're innately good kind of uh, mindset that's uh, really infiltrating the church and in general, um, you know, the world. And I think that sometimes what happens is we think hypocrisy is the other, right? We think that it's, uh, it's that church over there. It's this over here. Um, it's all of that. And, and this conversation comes up quite a bit uh, with my non-believing friends and especially my daughters, because um it, that is a huge issue. And I think like what you were saying, it is convicting uh, because there's a difference between the gospel being offensive mm -hmm. and Christians being offensive because they're not loving as Jesus loved. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I shared with my girls when I was talking with them over Christmas, you know, my, my daughter, Lou, who grew up a nominal Catholic, has been involved with church, but not because of faith necessarily, but because of tradition mm -hmm. and because there's some good things about church, but still has a lot of issues with the hypocrisy. Um, one of the things that she said to me um, is that she saw something different in the way that my husband and I lived our life, you know, that she saw that Christianity could be different than what she saw uh, in the news, you know. And I think that the onus falls on us as believers to portray something different to the world. But it, it doesn't come from this place of, oh my gosh, you know, I have to be different. It comes from a place of spending time with Jesus and then reflecting who it is we've been with. Lisa Turkhurst, I love her books as well. Um, I was leading a Bible study of hers one time and she was saying, you know, are you the kind of person um, who looks like she's been with Jesus? And I think that people can tell, right? We can tell. And so it's so easy in our culture to point fingers and say, ah, oh, you know, I mean, I do it all the time, Diana, if I'm being honest, you know, the other day, you know, things happen in our nation where I'm like, that is not Christianity, right? right. Whatever. But um, ultimately, I think the message of the gospel, again, going back to we're all flawed, we're all sinners, 
the Bible says there's no one righteous, no, not one. Right. So this idea that, you know, if I'm good enough, I can get into heaven. It's crap, right? Yeah, right. Not to use the bad word on your program. <laughs> crap was never a bad word in my family, but it's, it's garbage. It's, it's saying, you know what? Um, I can be good enough and that over there. And uh, my husband and I were just reading in scripture the other day, you know, um, where it talks about the Pharisees and they're, they're praying, mm. they're saying, well, thank you that I'm not like that over there. Right. Thank you that I'm not like this per person over there. And then the contrast with the tax collector, I think it was, who's praying and saying, God, you know that I'm a sinner. Help mm. me. And when we focus on ourselves, instead of, you know, looking at all the garbage that we see around us and we say, okay, God, um, show me how not to be a hypocrite today. Show me how to, um, you know, love you with all my heart today, because ultimately the Christian walk, it's all about loving God and loving people, right? It's love the Lord, your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. We don't have to focus on ourselves because guess what? When we focus on the Lord, it comes as a natural outpouring of focusing on him that we know who we are and then we can focus on other people. So when I talked with my, my biological children in the mornings and we go for drives and I drop them off for school, I always focus on remember who you are because of who he is, right? Mm -hmm. And when we know who he is, we know who we are so that we can go and be that with other people. And I think that keeps us from becoming really disappointed and judgmental towards the world because let me just tell you, um, there are so many times I get frustrated with what's happening, uh, you know, oh, in yeah. terms of what is portrayed to the world. Your friend who knows the Dalai Lama or the Buddhist that you stayed with, that doesn't surprise me. But yes, when I was in France uh, a year and a half ago before COVID, um, I walked into this shop and I was talking to a psychotherapist who was there and this other guy and they were saying, what do you think about Paris? And I was like, uh, it's nice. And they said, well, people are kind of mean here, rude. And I said, well, I always heard that, but kind of, you know, like, people don't seem very happy. And um, they said, well, it's, it's not like that in America and in Southern France is a little different. And I said, yeah, they go, well, you still have, you still have faith. And um, I said, I, I think we still have some hope, you know, and when we're people of hope, um, that trickles around and impacts the world around us in a way that we, we just don't know. And when you are somebody who is full of hope and light and love and spending time with Jesus, that impacts the people around you in a way that you, you just don't even know. And um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, that and so much more. I am, I'm a Francophile. I absolutely love French culture and mm. I have since I was a child and, I've never had the experience that the French were rude. I don't know. Maybe it was because I did so much research on the culture and I speak the language and uh, my sister is a citizen of France. So um, all the people that I've talked to, they were very nice and, and had lots of questions and we had good conversations and you know, they always tell you, don't argue, don't argue politics or religion with the French. And But the first thing they ask me about are the politicians <laughs> here. And the first thing they ask about is, you know, is about, you know, my, my religion or about America. And um, so I didn't have that experience at all. My husband didn't either. I, I made him, <laughs> I made him learn some of the cultural things and learn about 10 words. So he wouldn't offend anybody, but um, that might have been it. That might have been it because I was there with big, my mom and yeah. my Dutch water or my Dutch daughter, and uh, yeah, we were talking about some of it being a cultural thing. It yeah. just it wasn't necessarily the ru rudeness um, because people can be rude anywhere. It sure. was um, y there was a sad. It felt very sad, and um, it may just have been the day that we were in Paris. I don't know, um, but yeah, I wasn't. I, I love all cultures. I'm nothing against the French, right. <laughs> but um, it was, it was an interesting experience. And then it was very interesting to be walk into a shop and have them bring that up, you know, the same as what you're talking about. Like, oh, people can be kind of different here, huh? <laughs> so anyway. Yeah. If you get to know them, just like any other culture, they are, they're wonderful. Yeah. So we were talking about, okay, the church and you know, the church doesn't seem to want to invite certain kinds of people to come in the church as they are. Um, Jesus 
When Jesus was on this earth, the undesirables of that of that day were attracted to Jesus. Mm-hmm. The the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the mm-hmm. they had leprosy. They had all kinds of needs, and they were outcast of society. And they were flocking to Jesus because Jesus was ministering to them. Yeah. Jesus wasn't afraid of them. They he tried to meet their their needs where they were at. He forgave them, offered salvation to them. It was the Pharisees that he <laughs> that he yeah. argued with and had a hard time because they were the ones like, well, you have to follow the law this 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 way, and you have to look this way, and you have to, um, you know, you're doing this on the Sabbath. It's like, well, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You know that whole <laughs> mm-hmm. that whole passage. But you know, how can we as the church not be like that? Mm. You know invite people to come into church and be who they are and and find Jesus because they're not going to find they're not going to find Jesus out there like you said the world doesn't have the answers um mm-hmm. unless the church is the one that okay there's there's a kid on the back row that you know he's he's dressed all in black and you know black nail polish and long hair and the piercings and the tattoos. And I mean, what, what do you say to that, that kind of line of thinking? Mm. Yeah. I, I think it starts with humility and, uh, and just recognizing, um, that first of all, we're all broken and as believers, something that scripture is very clear about is that Christ has a heart for his church his bride. And so when we, um, you know, carry the weight of the hypocrisy and all of that, um, those are our brothers and sisters, you know, and unfortunately, sometimes those are the hardest people to love the people who claim to know the Lord, and then are so um, opposite of who Jesus is, right? It, it looks like, I, I think, I, I want to say it's Brendan Manning has a quote where he talks about like the biggest reason for atheism in the world today is people who go around claiming Christ with their lips and then denying him by their actions, you know? And so I think it's important for believers to say, okay, God, I love you. I know you love the church. Um, You prayed for unity. You prayed for it on the night you were betrayed. Um, I know it matters to you. So show me show me who you are and show me how to love well and to do my part to be the change that I see that needs to happen in the world. And I think that when we do that, it opens our eyes to, to burdens that God will put on our heart, you know, going back to passion and what you're willing to suffer for. Um, I, I had a youth pastor in high school who I remember him talking about, you know, praying that God would give him a heart for the lost that he would give him a heart for people who didn't know him. And, uh, and he told us to be careful when you pray that prayer. Cause he asked that God would actually like fill him with a physical agony and it happened. And he was like, don't oh. ever pray that. But um, I think God, God answers prayers like that very uh, in very tangible ways. And something that I've prayed is that God would give me a heart for a young woman who don't know him. Right. And um young women who maybe feel like they're in the back pew, who have grown up in the church, who now feel like they're on the outside looking in, or, or girls that, uh, you know, like my exchange daughters who have never heard anything but fake news about Christianity. Right. All they know is that Christians are against, you know, this or this or this, right? And so um, it's just asking God, hey, God, I love you. I know you love me. You created me in certain ways. Um, I want to use these gifts to the best of my ability while I'm here on earth. Uh, I believe this time is meant to glorify you and uh, to be a witness for you to the ends of the earth, right? How, how do I do that today in a practical way? Would you just lead me and guide me today? And I think uh, when we pray that kind of prayer, 
God answers it in beautiful ways. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, there's all these God sightings in your life because you're like, wow, God, you, you did this, right? I mean, when I pray, Lord, give me a burden for young women who are hurting, who are feeling like they're on the outside looking in. Do you know what he does? He brings those girls into my life. Mm. And then he allows me to speak to them in a way that, you know, I, like I said, grew up in a Christian home, but I dealt with my own issues of rejection and insecurity Mm -hmm. and then hurt. And then people claiming to love the Lord and then hurting me and rejecting me, you know? And so when we're honest about our own struggles, because we're all, we're all prone to hypocrisy. Um, But when we're honest and saying, you know what, I'm not perfect, but I know, I know Jesus and he's the answer, right? Like that opens up conversations. It allows us to be honest about our brokenness, to not hide our stories because our stories are his story that he gets to shine his light in. Um, I I mean, amazing things can happen and yeah, some of us aren't going to be going around and, you know, being influencers on Instagram or changing the world through a million books, you know, that sell a million copies or whatever, but we're going to be the people that he called us to be here on earth. And I think that's all that matters you know, to be surrendered to him and say, Lord, I, I, I know I want to be all in. I just want to be all in. So, and you know, there's a lot of practical ways that we can connect with people that maybe feel uncomfortable coming to church, you know, take them out to lunch, Mm -hmm. you know, and you've opened your home up to, to folks, but it just might be, you know, can I pray for you? Yeah. What needs do you have? What can I do to help help with, you know, practical needs in your life? Not just shoving Bible verses down their throat or mm-hmm. arguing with them. That's probably not the best approach, right? <laughs> no. Well, and the church, the church really is the church. It's the people, right? It's not the mm-hmm. building. Right. And so I think something that our culture really, especially here in America needs to do a better job of is realizing that the church actually does have to go out into the world, right? We need each other to encourage one another. We need each other to build each other up. Um, and obviously in times of COVID that can look very creative <laughs> in different ways, mm-hmm. but then we need to go out into the world and we need to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And, you know, uh, it's interesting you mentioned praying because, I don't, and this might've been on one of the episodes that you listened to of mine, but um, there's not a lot of people who will reject a prayer, right? Uh, If you, you see somebody hurting and they're sharing with you um, saying, you know, can I pray with you? Um, I don't think I've ever had somebody say, no, I, you know, please don't pray for me. Um, And that, that goes for my unbelieving friends and family. So um, yeah, just, Again, going back to, Lord, I want to be all in for you. Show me the people around me who who need love. Sometimes love looks like, you know, doing the dishes for somebody. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it looks like uh, changing the diaper of, Mm -hmm. you know, a snotty-nosed kid because your friend is, uh, you know, stressed out like crazy. Sometimes it looks like just walking through, going to a courtroom with somebody or whatever it is. Um, It's asking the Lord, uh, how can you use me today? I I just want to be used by you. Amen. I definitely have had some relatives that are not believers, and one of them actually called me up and, hey, I know you're a Christian, and can you pray for me? I'm having a really hard time, and that floored me. <laughs> well, yes, I'd love to pray pray for you. Can I pray with you now? Mm-hmm. Now, um, I have LGBT family members, and, you know, I show... I show love by listening to them and, you know, treating them with respect and individuals. And, you know, we've had these conversations because they know I love them. Like you love your girls. They know I love them. Mm -hmm. So they'll have a conversation with me. Well, I had this, we're born sinners. Mm -hmm. We're born sinners and that's why we sin, because that's our nature. But God sent his son to die on the cross for us and pay for those sins. So he loves you regardless of your sin. 
And that's, that's what it's about. It's not all these rules that we have to follow and all this, you know, church doctrine we have to memorize. It's God loves you and accepts you as you are. If you were the only one on this planet to die on the cross for, he would have done it. Mm. And so it just, just being loving towards somebody will open up the conversations that might be uncomfortable talking to a stranger about, you know, yeah. <laughs> off the street, you know, that doesn't know you, doesn't know that you care. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. And I think the more time, you know, somebody comes to the Lord, you know, because they're drawn in by the gospel and by uh, the love, you know, scripture says <laughs> they'll know we're, we are Christians because of our love. And um, then the transformational work happens, um, you know, but coming to Christ is always, you know, <laughs> recognizing I'm a sinner, you know, I need, I need his grace and there's no sin, um, you know, that God he can come in and he can, it doesn't matter how messed up you think you've made your life or how screwed up you feel like you are. Um, God can restore and he can rebuild and he doesn't leave us the same um, when we come to him, you know, uh, anyway. Yeah. So we have a lot of listeners, of course, that have, you know, suffered all kinds of abuse and they're re trying to recover from that and they don't know where, where they stand with God, mm -hmm. they either think I'm not worthy of God's love or I don't want anything to do with God because of what I went through. Um, that's a hard place to be. Yeah. I never stopped believing in God. I, I questioned why. Why did you let me go through this? Mm-hmm. I knew he was there. I was definitely mad at him. <laughs> yeah. Definitely mad at, at God, but never stopped believing in him. You know, I think, first of all, nothing's hidden from the Lord. Um, you know, scripture talks about that, about how, uh, you know, we can go up to the highest mountains. We can go to the like darkest valley and he's still there with us. And so if you're in that place right now where you are hurting and angry, um, I just want to encourage you that, first of all, God already knows, but uh, feel free to share with him, share with him where you're at, because <laughs> um, he's close to the brokenhearted. And as Diana already shared, um, when Jesus was here on earth, uh, the people that were broken, the people that were hurting the most were the people that were drawn the most to Christ. Um, so I encourage you to start reading, read in John or Luke about how much the Lord loves you and how much he came, um, how much he loved you when he came and died for you. And, um, I just think that when we read scripture and when we're honest with the Lord, um, man, things start to happen. And not only that, but then you start to realize as you're reading through the word, man, we, we have a God who has been through the worst kind of suffering, the worst kind of things that could happen, um, happened to him. You know, he was rejected by his own, um, the people that, you know, claimed to know his father, the best were the ones who plotted his death. Mm -hmm. You know, he came, I love how Max Lucado says he chose the nails, um, he came at a time in history. Think about it. God could have come at any time in history. When did he come? He came when the worst kind of murder and crucifixion, um, you know, was available. He could have come now, you know, when there were, <laughs> oh, I don't, yeah, that would have been uh, great lethal injection or something humane, you know, what we consider humane, but no, he came and he chose the nails. He chose the cattails. He chose to be battered and bruised and totally destroyed. And why, you know? He bore the weight of that. So whatever pain and suffering you've been through, you're going through and you're thinking, man, I don't know if God knows what this is like, or why would he allow this? Or, um, you know, all these different things cry out to him uh, because he does know what it's like to be rejected. He does know what it's like to suffer. He does know what it's like to be in pain and agony 
and um, be rejected. And so I would just encourage you. There's also a great resource that um, is a book that I read by a guy named Philip Yancey called Disappointment with God. That's yeah, I've read that one. It's excellent. Great book um, because it's real. You know, we're all going to go through times of disappointment with God. We're all going to go through valleys and, and mountains, you know, that's part of the human condition. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said earlier, the whole story of the Bible is a story of redemption and restoration. And um, there's something, there's something good, right? There's something good to look forward to. Amen. And this isn't all there is. And um, so just want to encourage you that way. This has just been an awesome conversation. And you, you have so many great books you like to read. I'm going to put all of those in the show notes for the listeners. Um, I'm just hoping that those that are listening um, realize that, you know, we have doubts about our faith, that we, we can talk about these things, and it's okay. We're on a, on a journey spiritually. Yeah. So um, and I certainly encourage everybody to listen to Janelle's podcast so tell them how they can connect with you yeah the best way is probably to go to my website you can either find me at janellewood.com or finding something real.com and i'm also pretty active on instagram i do an instagram live every fridays and you can find me there under janelle underscore m underscore wood but all of those links and different things to the podcast um, are found on my website and the finding something real podcast is available on apple spotify stitcher and hopefully all the places you know you you just put it out there and hope that it'll <laughs> pop up yeah <laughs> google yeah diana thank you for having me on i really appreciate it uh, having this conversation with you it's been it's been a a pleasure and god bless you thanks for coming on today thank you Thank you for listening to the Wounds of the Faithful podcast. If this episode has been helpful to you, please hit the subscribe button and tell a friend. You can connect with us at dswministries.org, where you'll find our blog along with our Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel links. Hope to see you next week. <laughs>